we want to put on the headset Nelson and we're going to be ready to rock and roll. Democracy Now! is underwritten by the French Broad Food Co-op, a grocery store focusing more on people than profit by providing living wages, supporting local farmers, and me. being community-owned. Citizens have a voice in how the co-op functions. Everyone can shop, and anyone can join. LP 103.7 Asheville. Good morning. You're listening to the Plains World show we heard each Wednesday here on the new WPVM LP in Asheville, North Carolina. You can also listen online at WPVMFM.org and watch on WPVM's Facebook page. I'm your host, Blaine Greenfield, and each week we focus on the Asheville theater scene as well as on positive news and information about people and organizations in the Asheville area. And toward that end, it's my pleasure to introduce my first guest, and he is Nelson Sartoris, Professor Emeritus of Chemistry and Poetry at where? Wittenberg University. Wittenberg University, but also, as I called you today in, in Facebook, Nelson, a poet extraordinaire. I don't know about that, but uh, I've been writing poetry the last few years, and it's uh, an incredible experience, quite a different uh, experience compared to what I did in my vocation as a chemist. Well, welcome aboard, Nelson. And I should also mention to you that I believe we're on Facebook Live, so you can wave to all your fans and friends, and hopefully to Mary Lou if she's watching it as well. Uh, I should mention that Nelson, as he indicated, taught organic chemistry for 37 years at Wittenberg University. His uh, PhD is uh, in chemistry from Northwestern, and he retired to Asheville 14 years ago and have taken over 130 courses at OLLI, UNCA. Is that a record or is up there? Uh, no, <laughs> I, I, it's, I don't think it's a record. I, there are a lot of people up there who live up there, literally, and it's a wonderful experience. Well, the, your experience, I think, is particularly wonderful, in, at least for your many fans and friends, in that he had never written poetry before. Four years ago, he enrolled in a poetry writing course. Since then, poetry has becoming, become his world, as he calls it, and he recently published his second book of poetry, which we'll be talking about, on, on wings of words. My first book of poetry, his first book of poetry, poetry was Brain um, Slivers, and that was published in 2016. And the question, Nelson, I ask, especially of um, retired chemistry professors, is that, do you always know as a kid, you grew up in Ohio? Oh, I, I grew up in Chicago. In Chicago. I worked in Ohio, yeah. Okay. Did you always know as a kid that you wanted to be a poet? No. I never had a dream of that or thought of it at all, and that's even true maybe five, six years ago. Uh, yeah. I, I think there was always an appreciation of poetry and read a little bit, but the, the thought of writing it was very intimidating, actually, um, and uh, it was the finding myself in a group of people over at Dolly. Uh, an instructor, and most of all, the, the other people who were very good poets who were encouraging, and uh, uh, it, it's my social group now, and it's wonderful. I'm in about half a dozen different poetry groups. You know, it's funny, Blaine. Uh, I tell people I'm going to go spend two hours in the afternoon with a bunch of old people uh, <laughs> uh, 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 reading poetry and, uh, uh, and analyzing each other's poetry to try to make it better. And they think, yeah, that sounds like I need a root canal <laughs> instead. Or, or uh, as I put it, uh, don't you have a sock drawer that needs straightening, which would be more fun? So, uh, but it is. It's more fun than I've had in, in most of my life. Well, back to growing up as a kid in, in uh, Chicago, you said you liked poetry. Did you ever memorize poems, or did you ever no, do that? No, I was never good at memorizing virtually anything. Uh, uh, that... That still remains something that's. Uh, I I can't. I don't even memorize my own poems. I probably only I, remember I one or two of them. Yeah. I have to. You know, what did I write? Um, 
that that's a skill that, that kept me off the stage, I think, because I couldn't remember lines. Um, but uh, uh, no, memorizing poetry seemed like when I was a kid, the last thing I wanted to do, I wanted to play third base for the Cubs. That's what I wanted to do growing up. So you mentioned the, the memorization. It's funny, I'm thinking about out loud with you that I'm going to be in a play um, at ACT and I have to memorize five lines and it's hard for me, you know, <laughs> get a long, large amount of lines. So back to you. So you don't memorize poems, but do you like performing them? Yes, I do. Uh, at first it was, you know, I had spent my entire life in front of a classroom, so I'm, I don't consider myself shy at all and don't have this, uh, this fear of, of public speaking. That, by the way, is still remains in our culture. Uh, the greatest fear that people have. They, they fear speaking in public even more than they, they fear cancer, which is amazing to me. But so I was very used to talking in front of people. But let me tell you, when you write your first couple of poems and you read them in front of even a small group, I mean, you feel like you're naked. And it's, it's uh, very intimidating, uh, uh, but not anymore. Uh, other people have been, as I say, encouraging. Uh, even though sometimes I show up and I think I got a really good poem, and then uh, uh, the, my, some of my friends just humble me with their, their ability. There's so much talent in the poetry world in this town. It, it, is, it is amazing. Well, for the benefit of our listeners who don't, mention, uh, who don't know about it, you mentioned that you took this, this course at Ali. And what is Ali? Ali is the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. It used to be the Center for Creative Retirement. It's on the campus of uh, uh, UNCA here in Asheville. And it's essentially a program of uh, continuing education for people who like ideas and want to learn things and, and, and want, to, want to commune with people who also are interested in ideas. Uh, I knew when I retired here uh, that was one of the attractions. Forget the mountains and all the rest. I, need, I had spent my life on a college campus. I think the reality of trying to live my life without spring break, break was intimidating. And so... Uh, I needed to be on a college campus. I needed to be in that environment. And you know what I found, Blaine? It's much more fun being on the other side of the classroom than being in front. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one of the things I love about Ollie, too, is that it's fun in that you don't have to write papers unless you choose to. Yes. You, don't have to you don't have to write poems unless you choose to. Sure, sure. And you don't also have to take exams. Well, the, that's, that's true. Uh, the, there are a few courses where there's a significant amount of writing if you want to do that. And there's also some courses that with significant amount of reading, and uh, that's that to me is a pleasure too. Uh, it's like being in your own book club, I guess. But uh, but you don't have to. And uh, but most people over there are very willing to put the effort in. They uh, they're very active learners. I like to say that Ollie is full of people that if you go over there, they're like me. Their bodies are starting to fall apart. <laughs> but when it comes to their mind, you better shit strap on your seatbelt because there are some really bright people who bring their whole world and uh, their life experience there t to the fore. Uh, there used to be a... I, I've taught in a few classes over there, and one of the, the little hints there initially was um, uh, your job as, to t in, in, as teaching these people is to realize that there probably will be several people in your class who know more about your topic than you do. And so as, a, as a, an instructor over there, your job is as much to throw some raw meat on the table and duck and get out of the way because nobody's timid and, and, and worried about peer group pressure. They, they're, they're willing to speak out, and that's fun. So what motivated, motivated you to take the first poetry course? In other words, you've been taking a whole bunch of courses over the years. Yes. Uh, it was, I had a class, uh, class schedules, there's usually there's one at nine, there's one at midday, and one in the afternoon. I had one in the morning, and I had one in the afternoon, and so midday I had an open slot, and there was this poetry class, and I thought, oh, I haven't done that. And uh, some people ask me why I take a course, and it's because, well, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> All right, that's, that's I want to find out something. So I took this course, and uh, I almost quit the first day because they gave an assignment. Uh, interesting story. Uh, our assignment, uh, well, the instructor, Mike Ross, was a gem, and he, he ended up reading a poem at the end of the class, and it was a poem about a shopping experience at a dollar store, and it was kind of sad. It was kind of uh, depressing, really, 
And our assignment then was in the week to come back the next week to class having and writing a poem about a shopping experience. Well, I thought, uh, how can I write a poem about Amazon.com? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was actually then going going home, I was thinking to myself, I'm going to drop this course. I can't, I can't write this. And then I started to turn the corner into, into where our development is. And sure enough, I looked over and I saw the ABC store and I said, yes, I do shop. <laughs> and so I actually went on a rainy Saturday day in the fall to hang out at the ABC store to get an inspiration for a poem. And sure enough, it was there. And that first poem is in the, my first book. I was just going to ask you. It, it's in my first book. Now, th let me ask you, did you ever s share that with the people at the ABC store? No, not with the ABC store. You should, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it, it was, uh, uh, it was, and from there, I don't know, if I hadn't looked over and saw the ABC store and the shopping experience, I may not even have written anything. Now, when you took the course, did you think it was going to be like a poetry appreciation course, or did they tell you that no, you actually No, I knew it was writing? going to be a writing course. I knew, I knew that. And uh, uh, I was... You know, I had written so much as, as an academic, but not in poetry. Uh, and uh, so it was, a, it was a different venture for me, and I, I'm open to those things. Because I would imagine Ali has had, or if not, be a good course to, to, to offer courses for poetry appreciation. Do, have they, they had do those that courses? too, yes. And I've taken, oh, since that first course in uh, poetry writing, I've taken. Uh, maybe another 10 or 12 poetry writing courses uh, over there. In other words, I continue to do this, um, and I'm taking another one this summer. And so uh, it, you just learn a little things as you go, and uh, you get some helpful hints. And, it, and usually there's a bunch of the, now the, the same, same people who uh, take this. One of my poetry groups, for example, here in Asheville, there, we have, there are three Brits in there, and they cheat. Because they had a real <laughs> education, they're literate, you know. And uh, we have, and in that same group, there's a, a Scotsman. He could read the phone book, and it would sound good, you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, there, we, there's a South African woman, and so there's an incredible mix of people that come together, and it, it, you, you get ideas and inspiration from them and their poems, and vice versa. Now you talk about getting inspiration for your poems. How often do you write poetry? Uh, most every day I try. Doesn't mean it's any good that day. And some days I'll be very inspired and I'll get an idea and maybe three or four ideas and I'll just, they'll roll out in a rough form as I call them. They're my preemies. And uh, uh, then I kind of assess, uh, are they going to be worth pursuing even further? Uh, some days I say, oh, it's raining out, and I think, oh, what a wonderful day to write a poem. And I'll sit down, and, you know, the, the old writer's block is is, is wall, right? and, you, and there's nothing there. Uh, but the fun is, Blaine, once you, you know, write and try to shape a poem, you need, I need, at least, other people's input on that because you can get in your own mind game, and you can fall in love with your own phrases. And so what we do is we'll get together in a poetry group, and uh, you read your poem, and everybody will give you constructive, if this were my poem, I would do this. And you take their advice or not, that's up to you, but I solicit that. I'm really looking for that. And the, some people say, that's a really good poem, but the title is just not right. And so the title can, titling poems can be fun. Well, I was going to ask you that. Um, so what comes first, the poem or the title? Uh, the, the poem comes first. Uh, Do you ever have a title and then write a poem off it? No, I don't think so. I, 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 I haven't done that. There may be other people. You get a nugget of an idea. Uh, the way to describe writing a, a, a poem to me is like driving in the dark. Uh, you can only see as far as your headlights will allow. But you do that the whole way. In other words, I've started a poem thinking it was going to go one way, and it ended up going a totally a different way. And it, you, it's, you just make it up as you go along, and I don't know where that comes from, from your life experience, I guess. Uh, and uh, I, I started off writing a, a poem. Uh, I thought it was a serious poem. I'll back up a little bit here. It's interesting. Everybody's afraid of death. 
but poets can't wait to get to their desk to write about it. <laughs> <laughs> wait, is that, is that your line? No, oh, I don't know. I, you don't know where you, who's, you know, don't you remember, Blaine, the, you know, if you, if you steal from one person, it's plagiarism. <laughs> if, you, if you steal from a bunch of people, then that's called research. Well, so. well, well I'll tell people, give me the first time you use it, give me credit thereafter, it's yours. You know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, wait, what was that line again? Do you remember? What, what the, you just told me. Uh, about the, the po poets. Right. Uh, everybody's afraid of death. Right. But poets can't wait to get to their desk to write about it. And that, that's a, one of the topics, I think, particularly, uh, well, even younger poets, I think the, the mystery of death invites poetry in some ways. What about politics? Do you ever do Oh, about yes, I, I rant. <laughs> yes, of course, I rant. And, there's, of course, there's a lot of material these days to, to, to uh, give you fodder for that. Uh, uh, so, yes, uh, uh, and... Uh, Political poems can, I don't think they have a, a, a lifetime, a lifespan of very long, <laughs> but w one would hope in some ways. Right? No, that's interesting, it, it, because yes, you're not going to want to read them. I've never read a poem about Eisenhower that I recall, you know. Uh, oh, yeah, you know, there, there, there are lots of them oh, about current men, administration, yes, uh, exactly. trust me. Now, so let me ask you, since you, you do have your, your book with you, also have some of the poems, let me just ask you, maybe read, I'll let you choose it, um, one of the poems, and then we'll uh, perhaps have time for a couple okay. others. Uh, I, I'll, I'll start with one that uh, is kind of a, an existential experience, really. Uh, the poem is entitled There. Always on our way. We will never get there. It's impossible to get there because there is no there. There's only the journey, only struggle, only sought and savored temporal joys along the path. Goudot will never come. We will never find him. We are on this path but a few moments, yet those moments are real. But the only there is here. The only time is now, the only odyssey in our head, the only meaning found in other travelers on their way there. One of the things I love about your poems, actually two things, one is that they're short, you know, for the most part. Most of your poems are short, right? Is that yes, I think, more, yes. Uh, <laughs> The, the shorter, the more condensed it is, I think the better it is. I wish I were better at it. You know, there's this uh, old old saying that uh, Mark Twain said one time. He said, uh, as he wrote a letter to one of his friends, he said, my apologies for this long letter. I didn't have time to write a short one. <laughs> and it's true. It, it, if you want to just ramble on, and roll, but if you want to make it concise and pithy, it takes work. But, but I like the fact that not only they're short, but I can also understand them, you know. And, and let me ask you another thing. Some people may have that misconception that there are poet, poems and poets who rhyme everything. Yes. Yet, you know, and you're pointing out with some of your work, you don't have to rhyme everything. Do you, no. Do you ever rhyme stuff? Yes, I did. Uh, initially, I, I did more rhyming uh, than, than I do, think I do now. I do more free verse now. Uh, in a way, the rhyme was comforting when I started to write. Because in the science business, in the kind of logical mindset that I used to live my life, uh, I needed some structure. And, and rhyming provided that kind of framework of structure. But the trouble with rhyming is if it's good rhyme, it's wonderful. But if it's forced <laughs> and if it's, it's a, a little bit stilted, one bad stilted rhyme in the poem can ruin the whole thing. And so I'm, I find myself more these days doing what I would call internal rhymes, slant rhymes, that is uh, rhyming within a line and in the middle of a line with the next line so that it isn't quite the ending of just every, each line rhyming at the last word. I don't think that's necessary. And I think those are much more interesting and can be much more playful with words uh, if, if you do that. When you write a poem, do you have um, your wife Mary Lou read them? Uh, not so much at first. I usually, when I when they polish them a little bit, I'll let her read them. Uh, the uh, I, I have a little a little longer poem. It's one of my favorites. 
Um, it's a poem I actually wrote about her. Okay, please. And, uh, and Mary Lou, if you're listening, which I think you are, uh, hello. Anyway, uh, yeah, people sometimes say, what's one of your favorite poems? I don't know if this is her favorite poem, but uh, uh, this, this came out of an inspiration of just looking out the window at her. And it's called My Gardener. Shadows lengthen as the solstice-bound sun approaches its acute angle apogee. Brisk winds temper the last tepid warmth of summer. Maple leaves display autumnal autographs. Night arrives now in early evening. Soon clocks will be spun backward and winter's darkness will reign. I watch her through the window in the peaceful fall twilight. She trims her roses one last time, carefully gathering the clippings, tidies her Stelladora lilies, digs up her rare red dahlia bulbs, then shears the clematis vine whose blooms smothered the mailbox just last month. This annual autumn canvas of my gardener in her Eden, pensively toiling in anticipation of next spring's renewal, is blurred this year by welling tears. Chemo infusions begin tomorrow for her relapsed myeloma. Next fall, will the windowed watercolor of my gardener's earthly bliss be another portrait or just a landscape? She's been battling this myeloma for nine years and winning the battle pretty well, but it's an incredible journey. Uh, so. I, I, I consider that a love poem. She, oh. <laughs> she, I, I think she would consider the poems that are more hallmark variety than oh, the no. ones that she, she would wish I would write. Oh no, I love that. That's uh, so sweet. The um, so you said you write, you try to write every day, and I guess that's good advice for writers of any kind of um, uh, poetry or literature. Um, what gives you the, the actual idea f for a poem? Well, that's the thing. You say I write every day. I, I, even just like coming here this morning, I, I'll see something and it'll be a thought for a poem. And I'll immediately, you know, in my phone, I'll put a one or two words that that's, that's an idea. So I'm kind of constantly looking for it. And there's a poem in almost everything. Who knows, Blaine, I might write a poem about well, you. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. The, um, <laughs> but the inspirations come in, in lots of different ways. Um, uh, the other morning, I, for example, a uh, poem I just recently wrote, I woke up just hearing the thud, 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 thud of a pileated woodpecker. And that just led to a poem about uh, an old oak tree that's in my little woods that uh, should ought, ought to be have taken down by a lumberjack, right, by a forestry person. But I decided to leave it up for the woodpeckers. So the poem essentially goes on that, I, I've hired the woodpeckers. It'll take them a while, and I'll pay them in bugs and grubs. <laughs> so, uh, but th that's where an idea comes from. Oh, you I, don't you don't have that poem yet? It's uh, not I, I don't know. It's not in not in this book. It's it, and it's not finished either. By the way, I don't think a poem is ever finished. I mean, I find myself even in the first book going back and saying, "Gee, I should have done this a little differently." I and the expression, and I don't know who to attribute this to. Uh, is that a poem is never finished, it's only abandoned. You leave it at, at some point, but then you might pick it up again. There's a story of a, of, uh, a, a poet uh, who used to put her poems on a refrigerator, and then like once a month she would change one word. It would take her about 10 years to write a poem, and it's at what point do you think it's finished? I often wonder that about visual artists, if you're doing oils or watercolor. You know, what would happen if you did one more stroke <laughs> or, or, you know, one more twist in Mona Lisa's smile or one less, would it have been a hit? You, w when to quit? And that's really difficult sometimes. Well, talk about the process then, as you just indicated, to make a decision and then to actually put poems into a book. And we'll talk about both your books. Yeah. But I, I was so impressed with the fact that you did this so what made you decide to take to put that first book together? Uh, I think a part of the motivation was my, my mother, who's nine, now 99, living independently still in California, a remarkable woman, uh, 
didn't know I was writing poetry, didn't know I'd taken poetry classes. Uh, she's in California, and, she's, and I thought, gee, that would be a really neat thing to do, to put together a book, uh, which I did a few years ago. I think she was 96 at the time. And I just wanted her to go to her mailbox and open this package and see this. And, and she did, but you know what? Her, her, so she commented, and that was, a, that was worth her, her response when I, you know, opening this first book of poetry, obviously surprised her chemist's son, you know, was doing this. And, and she then, didn't even know you were taking no, a course? No, no, not at all. And, uh, uh, but though she was very touched, the first thing she said, this just will give you an idea who she is, she said, yeah, I like the book, Nelson, but why did you have to send it first class? You could have <laughs> sent it book rate. <laughs> I think she's still living in the Depression. but uh, so That's how she remembered the book. Yeah. But So you decided to put all the poems together in a book, and you published it? Well, uh, there's a, a Pisgah Press here in town right. run by a really erudite person, uh, Andy Reid. Uh, I uh, I brought the kind of manuscript to him, and he gave me some ideas and thoughts, and just said, "You know, we're not going to make a lot of money on a poetry book." <laughs> and I said, "Yeah, I, I realize that." And uh, but it's he runs Pisgah Press, and both have been published by Pisgah Press with the help of Andy. And Andy is an incredible resource in this community. He's uh, get, he, he'd, he'd make a wonderful right. guest for oh, you. Making the, Andy uh, Reid. Andy Reid. Yeah, uh, he, he runs Pisgah Press. And, Great. Uh, the story, again, of, of my mother, when I was growing up, she used to tell me, Nelson, if you ever find yourself the smartest one in the room, get up and go to another room. <laughs> well, put it this way. If Andy's in the room, I don't have to leave, all right, ever. So he, <laughs> he, he's a pretty bright guy. Did you ever write a poem about your mom? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, there, in, the, in this book, there, there are a couple of them. I, I don't have that it? one. You, I can, I, you I can find it as Nelson's talking, uh, but I'd love to hear it. And then, then hopefully we'll send a, a copy of the YouTube clip to your mom or somehow we'll get her to listen to it. But this will dedicate, if we can find it, to Nelson's okay. mom. This is Loaves and Fishes is the title. Circa 1950, family still poor. Breakfast before school, pour out the Cheerios half burned black. Mom is irate, unsheathes her literate poison pen, dashes off missive to General Mills, <laughs> crams the charred O's into the envelope. <laughs> Even parts with a three cent stamp her ultimate expression of being violated but now off her chest. Two weeks later, doorbell rings, surprise. Company rep proffers apology with two cartons of O's. <laughs> Mom hastens to the cupboard, stashes the bountiful booty, then takes out the Wheaties and starts toasting them. <laughs> well, I love that. That's Nelson. true. Yeah. Every, every word is true. And she's still, you're still the ultimate uh, uh, consumer advocate. <laughs> so, but we learned something from Nelson, so buy a product, toast. <laughs> <laughs> and then send, get two cartons back. Is that a great story, though? And well, anyway, uh, yeah. Well, you uh, know, there's another poem in there about her because she, uh, uh, when I was growing up and always testing the limits of behavior in Chicago, her, her favorite expression to me, I could probably get her arrested for child abuse now, but she would say, Nelson, if I was doing something bad, Nelson, you're, you're breeding a scab. <laughs> Ooh, I understood what that meant. <laughs> Right. But that was her way of saying, you're going to be scarred if you continue. You know, another beautiful thing about your poems, Nelson, and it's kind of a compliment to you, is that I'll read them just like I did that last one. What a great poem. And I laugh, you know. And, and I mean, I both, I feel, you know, certain poems reach my heart and certain poems reach my funny bone. And that's kind of cool, isn't it? That you get people well, to I do get both. that comment I, that there's a. Uh, a less ephemeral quality, and that may be from the science background. I, I envy some of my poet friends who can really write beautiful metaphors, and uh, um, I'm a little bit more direct. It's it's it's, it's nothing too subtle sometimes. Uh, I'll, let me read you another okay, one of my one, favorite. One final ones. poem. Shoot. Um, okay. 
silent words. This is not about my mother. <laughs> More about my wife. She has become a language I learned to speak, a language without words, a lexicon of the heart, a dialect of touch and glance, a parlance known only to us, a sovereign code of tacit tones, music and song we alone can hear, poems no pen can write. What occurs, occurs without sound, when we are gone, it will disappear, but what will be lost has not been lost on us. And that certainly, you know, makes you think, or may, again, difference in reaction. You know, the other, I laugh, this I, I was moved by. Thank you. Nelson, if any of our listeners want to get a hold of this uh, book, this is the second uh, book of poetry you wrote, On Wings of Words. The best bet is to what? Best way to get it is through Amazon, of course. Uh, uh, if you just Google Sartorius, and by the way, Faulkner wrote a novel called Sartorius. <laughs> so if you Google Sartorius, you'll get my book, and then Faulkner comes comes right up there. That's probably kind of nice company to be. <laughs> and and the Sartorius, the book by Faulkner, I never read. That was written about you. No, it was not. <laughs> no, no. It, reading Faulkner is a real challenge, by the way. I was going to say that. Yeah. So uh, Nelson, again, if folks want to get on Wings of Words, and the first book was what? Uh, bl brain Slivers. Okay. Both of them are on Amazon. I love that first title, too. And just look up Nelson Sartoris, and I'd like to thank you for being my guest this first half hour on the Blaine's World Show, and it's always a pleasure. My pleasure, Blaine. Okay, buddy. Good to be with you. Good seeing you. Thanks a lot. That was fantastic. I really appreciated it. As Nelson's working his way out of the studio, I'd like to mention that support for this show and WPVM is unwritten by the Grail Movie House, Asheville's Alternative Cinema. Grill Movie House is an independent, locally owned, three-screen cinema located in downtown Asheville. For current features, visit the Grail website at grillmoviehouse.com or use the Grail's social media pages. As uh, Nelson I'm trying to get him out of here, works his way out, I'd also like to mention two upcoming theater productions in the area. And the, the first one is or not a theater production, but it's a CD release concert for Waltzing Out of Town, the Richard Schulman's Trio's latest CD. That's going to be tonight, Wednesday, at White House, White Horse Black Mountain. That's in uh, Black Mountain, North Carolina. For information, uh, whitehouseblackmountain.com. In addition, I believe it's tomorrow night, Thursday, Bright Star, a bluegrass musical, opens its heart in Mars Hill, and it's going to run through s June 16th. It's going to be a terrific show about... Um, Swooping Love and Redemption set against the backdrop of the Asheville Madison County Blue Ridge Mountains in the uh, 1920s. And for inf information about that show, you can go to www.sartplays.com. And talking about plays, it's next my pleasure to, to introduce, having trouble with the words today, Victoria, um, our second guest to the Blaine's World Show this week, Victoria Lambert. And Victoria Lambert is an actress, a local actress, director, marketing expert. She does lots of different things. Welcome aboard, Victoria. Hi. Thank you, Blaine. Okay. And well, Victoria, you can also uh, say hello. I don't know if we had it last time around, but I believe we're on Facebook Live, so you can say hello to all your fans and friends out there in the Facebook world. Hi, Facebook. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Victoria has been acting since middle school. Is that acting or acting up? Both. <laughs> <laughs> She's worked professionally in Nashville, Memphis, Los Angeles, and West North Carolina. She's also a professional um, writer, PR person. Mm -hmm. She does a little bit of everything, graphic designer, marketing consultant, specializing in theaters and nonprofits. And the question, Victoria, I always ask, may have asked you the last time you were on the show, but you grew up where? I grew up in Middle Tennessee. Okay, and when you were a little kid, did you have the theater bug? Uh, yes and no. I think I had um, delusions of grandeur. I wanted to be on television. I remember asking my parents very young, maybe about five or six, how to get on uh, a show that was on PBS. And um, so I had the bug. I didn't really have the outlet for it until much later on. We had moved to a small community um, in the Upper Cumberland area of Tennessee, and there was a really great community theater there that did a summer program 
big summer musical every year. And that was really my first experience to roll theater. And that was for kids or for everybody? It was for everybody. Um, this was a small community at the time, maybe 15,000 people. And the um, government, the community itself, had actually built a really nice performing arts center for these productions. And so they would have most of the community come out. We would do like four or five weekends during the summer, maybe 50, 60, sometimes 100 people in the show. It was really quite an elaborate production for a small town. Do you remember your first show? Very, very first show uh, was probably in school, middle school, um, seventh grade. I was in a show called The Roaring Twenties, and it was uh, just about as bad as that title <laughs> sounds. <laughs> I was thought, wouldn't this be a cool thing for a fundraiser, maybe for a local theater, is that if everybody did their first show, you know, you don't have to mm -hmm. do the whole show, but just like five minutes of it or... Did, did you sing in that show, sing and dance? No, this was, this was oh, a drama? straight show. The very first musical I was in, I think, was Annie Get Your Gun. But wouldn't it be cool if you mm -hmm. had to do your first monologue or your first song you ever sang mm -hmm. and just have everybody recreate the, the very first thing they ever did? That would did. be a lot of fun, actually, to yeah. see people come up and do things that they did, even you know when they were really young and things like that. And the shame of it, I'll ask a lot of actors, that a lot of times it wasn't videotaped. Or they don't have a YouTube mm -hmm. clip of it or mm -hmm. something. So this could be a chance to, to get back. Uh, into it. So that was really cool. You acted in a community theater mm -hmm. in Tennessee. Did you continue with studying or did you go on to study it? I did study acting um, for, I actually have a minor in theater. Um, I went to the University of Memphis. It was Memphis State at the time, so that sort of gives you the idea of my age. And uh, I started as a theater major. That was what, 17 years ago? That was, yeah, oh, just 10 years ago. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> uh, so I was, a, I was a theater major and then um, through family pressures and just myself, I guess, at the time, just did not feel like I had the confidence to continue that. So I went and changed and had to get a degree in uh, advertising and public relations. When you were in college, though, were you acting? I was time? acting. I did act the entire time. I was a very uh, active actor as well as a, I was a dancer as well. So I did tour some, with some dance companies and some things like that when I was in college as well. So then you went into advertising and PR, mm -hmm. and that was kind of your professional background That's for a while? That's my professional background. Um, I went out of college. I actually worked on a master's degree for a while at Marquette University in advertising and public relations. I decided I just really wanted to get back to the South, didn't like graduate school, and came back to Tennessee um, in Nashville, and that was my professional career. I started out working for a trade association and then moved into freelancing and did a lot of nonprofit work over the years. Because one of the cool things I think you do, and you do it very well, is you know that if you're in acting or theater, you mm -hmm. have to kind of promote what you're doing. Yes. And I get very frustrated, and perhaps you do too, is a lot of actors don't do that. They don't realize that, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, the line I use oftentimes, Ken Blanchard is kind of a management theorist, wrote a lot of books, and he says, if you don't toot your own horn, Somebody else will use it as a spittoon. You know? Wow, okay. <laughs> and, but what it reminds me of the stuff you do when you do it so well is that too many actors and performers don't want to toot their own horn. They don't want to invite people to even their own shows. They, they don't. Yes. I, I get so frustrated on Facebook, they don't even invite their friends to come see their show. Mm -hmm. And it's a shame because you have to invite people. Yes, yes, you do, especially. Um marketing dollars for theaters in general, even the most successful professional theater are always limited. There's never enough money to really promote. And so it really relies on grassroots marketing in a lot of times. And that grass, those people, the, the best ambassador for anything is the person that's in the show, or the actor, or the people that are working behind the scenes, the stage managers. Um, I think if you go into a show, you have to be proud of it and you have to be wanting people to come see it. Well, one of, the shame, one of the sad things in Asheville, and we were talking at, at a meeting I was at last night about this, is that even the local paper has stopped theater reviews. You know, yes. and, and what a shame, because mm -hmm. that's how I would see about theater and read about theater. And if it's not in the local paper, mm -hmm. you really have to find other ways to get the word out. Mm -hmm. Yes, you do. Now, social media has been tremendous at that as far as taking into a lot of the gap that uh, print media used to have. Um, Social media is, is a great way, and of course, like you said, inviting friends, inviting family, it's a great way to get the word out and to get images and videos and all these things out that, you know, 
we didn't use 10 years ago, video was almost unheard of for a theater promotion. Well, it's funny you say that because mm -hmm. even, as you know, we're now using Facebook Live. We find that if we use Facebook Live, I don't understand why, but a lot of people watch it. Mm -hmm. You know, If we just put it on the radio, some people listen to it. Mm -hmm. And so I've seen, as you said, a lot of theaters now are doing even clips of, of shows or clips yes. of rehearsals. Mm -hmm. And you get to see it. It, it. I think it's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. And that's a perfect segue into the fact that in your spare time now, you're currently working on another show right now. You're in a show. Yes, in my and spare time. In your spare, exactly. And a show that opens, what is it, um, it opens Friday? Friday night, yes. Friday night. And that show is what? Uh, August Osage County. It is a um, tremendous show. Uh, probably one of the classics of modern theater in America. Uh, it's won all kinds of uh, critical acclaim, um, but it is it is a monster of a show as well. Um, very much written as a dark comedy. And so if you've seen the movie, you really haven't seen the show because the show is much, much funnier, much, much lighter, but it still d deals with a really um, deep, dark issue, which is addiction and suicide in families. And uh, so all the, the fun part, of course, though, it's because it's a dysfunctional family. I wouldn't it's say it's a fun part. But yeah, the very it, dysfunctional. I, the thing I remember seeing the film, and I haven't seen the show, and I'm mm -hmm. quote seeing it, is that it'll make you appreciate your family. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's what I got mm -hmm. out of it. I said, no matter how dysfunctional you may think your family is, there's there are other there are, there are the Westons, and that's <laughs> if you are not at that level, you're going to feel really good about where you are when you go to Thanksgiving. <laughs> well, great way to that, that's a great that would be a great tagline for it. You know, make if you want to appreciate Thanksgiving, come yeah. come visit mm -hmm. this family. The um, when people see the show, what are they going to see? I think they're going to be very surprised. It is um, although it deals with a pretty heavy subject. It has a lot of lightness in it, a lot of very quirky, uh, awkward comedy, which is a lot of fun to do on stage. We have an amazing cast of people. Uh, there's 13 of us in the cast. Everybody is um, an amazing actor. Uh, we have a lady on the stage with us who's playing Violet, who is the mother in the show, that the part that Meryl Streep played in the movie, named Cece Blackburn, who is absolutely amazing. She's done professional theater for years and years and years. I haven't seen uh, her locally, yeah, have I don't yet? think she, I think oh, she's new to great. the area, um, but she has uh, worked everywhere from New York to Los Angeles. She's amazing. She really is. Uh, we have a large cast of, of, I guess we would call Western North Carolina regulars as well, um, but it's been just a really fun show to put together. Let's talk a little bit about the show then, with mm -hmm. respect, we'll take from top. Uh, we have kind of a mutual friend who I'm really excited to see in, in her directing debut, I guess, almost, and that's who? That's Beth Norris. Um, Beth is amazing. I directed Beth on stage. I remember it, right. About a year and a half, two years ago, a year and a half ago. Um, she's an amazing actress, but she this is her first, I guess, solo directing project. She's co-directed and assistant directed, um, but this is really her first time to go out on her own and, and to take on such a massive uh undertaking. It's a massive story, a massive set. Everything about it is just, it's big. It's what you would expect of an American tragic comedy, I guess, in every way. So it, she's really done a wonderful job. I understand also there's another obscure kind of actor in, in the show. Some guy by the name of Tate Alpert yes. is in the show. Yes. And I think we know him a little bit, too. How yes. do we know Tate Albert? Well, I'm married to Tate Albert. He's what Western North Carolina's best-kept acting secret. What a surprise. <laughs> But no, it's so much fun to watch Tate. I got to know him the first time several years ago mm -hmm. in um, Young Frankenstein. Yes. And I got friendly with him, and he's always telling me about his acting he'd done. He said, well, tell me more. And since then, I've seen him in several shows. But yeah, Young Frankenstein, he just had this court. He was in the chorus. Mm -hmm. But since then, boy, has he done a lot of stuff. Yes, here, right? yes. Very talented actor. How is it acting with your husband? I enjoy acting with my husband. Um, he and I are not playing... And any he plays my uncle in the show, which is very unusual <laughs> for me. Uh, but we've been in several shows together. We actually met doing theater about 20 years ago, and uh, we love to act together. We, our time has been somewhat limited on the stage over the last 15 years because of children, but we are now just now getting to a place where we can enjoy being in shows together, and it's a lot of fun. He's a lot of fun to be on stage with. 
And, and I ask you, too, the, the question I asked you off the air, and hopefully the tape's listening, too. So you've been together for a while. How long have you been together? Not long enough. <laughs> what a... I can't believe you said that. I'll have to put that... Let me put that down, then. So I'll have to remember that. Tate, if you're listening, listen to what Victoria had to say about you and them. She hasn't been long enough with you. That's very sweet. I'm very impressed you Thank said you. that. Thank you. Just came, you. You just came up with that on your own? Yes, it just topped top of my head. <laughs> what a woman. <laughs> anyway, the, I've never heard that before. I'll have to remember that. But anyway, so uh, you've acted with Tate. The um, Now, when you... When you're acting with him, do you rehearse with him, too, or do you run lines with each other? If we are, well, if we are, have scenes together, we will run lines back and forth. I, he's a tremendous help to me because I have a huge role in the show, um, and he will is very patient about helping me through lines. Um, we, we work back and forth. He was just in a show, a two-person show, which he had a tremendous number of lines, and so we just sort of take turns helping each other and running lines with each other, and doing whatever we need to do to sort of help each other along. Because that amazed me. His last role was, um, the show was... Oleana. Mm -hmm. And boy, did he have a big part in that. Yes, yes. And it, it, and it, two people, so yeah, they were both huge parts. Is that tough for you, memorization? Yes, I think, you know, anytime you have that many lines where you're carrying half of a show in that case, I think it's it's tough, but I think also that show was, was David Mamet wrote that show, it's written in a way that's very conversational, but can be very difficult to learn with a lot of ums and, you know, pauses and, and kind of awkward cutting each other off, uh, the actors cutting each other off and things like that. So I think that was a real challenge for him. And are the ums actually in the play? In the, in the oh, script? Yes, he, he writes ums and ahs <laughs> and, you know, ahs. Uh, 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 and in, in this script, August Osage is very similar to that as well. I think it's very much a kind of a modern show in that way where it is written, where you kind of get the indication that people are cutting each other off or talking over top of each other or sort of stumbling through their words, just like people do in real life. Talk about some of the rest of the cast that, that you can remember. Uh, well, Jennifer Mimolo, oh. um, I he plays Aunt Mandy Faye, which is, I think, one of the best characters in the show. If uh, She is the eccentric aunt that everyone has uh, that is, you know, kind of too touchy-feely and wants to give everybody some sugar when they walk in. Um, Jess O'Connor, I think is his last name, uh, I've had, who's a new actor in the area who's playing my husband, Bill. And uh, we also have on stage with us Allison Starling as Jonna. Um, I wish I had brought a list. Okay, well, <laughs> I'm sure I'm leaving somebody out. <laughs> uh, a, a lot of local <laughs> A lot of people. local actors, yes. And Jennifer, you mentioned, just always amazes me because everything she's in, it's different. You know, it's... Um, just very talented actor, very I think. Very talented, yes, she is. And she's different every time you see her. Yes, yeah. too. Or the one knocked my socks off, just digress. She was in Brevard in the uh, Lion in Winter. Mm -hmm. Yes. And wow, was that powerful. Mm -hmm. So the uh, show definitely look forward to. A little bit different. But uh, that show opens when, by the way? It opens this Friday, May 31st, and it runs through uh, June 9th. So short run. Though. Short run, two weeks. Oh, two weekends. Okay. Friday, Saturday at 7.30 and Sunday at 2. Okay, but people are in for a, a treat if they get to see that show. Let's talk about some of the stuff you're, you've been in, too, because I think since you've been here, it seems like I've seen you just about everything you, you've been in, and you were also telling me off the air you directed, and I saw the one thing you directed. Mm -hmm. what, what was the one thing you directed? Love Lost and What I Wore at Hendersonville Community Theater. And is that the first time you had directed? That is the first time I've directed here in Western North Carolina. Um, I directed regularly in Tennessee. Um, I actually did some professional directing before we came here, um, but that was my first chance and foray into directing here. And do you have preference directing or acting? I prefer directing, honestly. Why is that? You know what? I don't know. I came to it later in life. I really didn't ever have any indication or, or think I, people would mention to me oh, directing, and I'd be like, oh, I don't want to direct. But when I was, um, I, I had a children's educational program, dramatic educational program, when we were in Tennessee. And so through teaching, I sort of learned, kind of figured out that I enjoyed directing because we would do these big, you know, parent shows every semester. And I was like, hey, you know what? I kind of know what I'm talking about here. Uh, when I would, you know, all these things you sort of hear all your whole life when you're on stage, but you never really think about the fact that you're going to pass those on to somebody. And from that, it sort of just sort of naturally 
and organically went into directing shows um, in the Tennessee, Nashville, Tennessee area. Started out with kids shows uh, outside of the program, and then we I moved into like just doing regular stage shows with adults. I was going to ask you, do you prefer directing kids or adults? You know, I I honestly probably adults. Although my favorite age to have when I did classes was middle school, um, and it was and usually you know even when you have kids in a show. Most of the time, they're a lot of fun to be there because they want to be there. They've chosen to be there, so it makes they're just like sponges that soak everything up. It's just I think adults catch on to things a little bit faster, maybe than most of the time. Although some adults are like children as well, so it's just it's you know it's actually benefited me greatly as a director because I had to learn how to communicate very concisely and and very clearly about what I wanted and what I needed for people to kind of envision along with me. Mine's you know, one show I saw years ago. It was a version of uh, Oklahoma, and they had one role was played by a kid. He was playing a, a, an older cowboy, but he was in the show. They were mm -hmm. short or something, and it's like about ten years old. And you could see he really hated to be there. You know, it's almost yes. like it, it was almost like he was being punished by his parents. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. instead of time out, you have to be in a show. You have to go be in the show, yeah. And it really ruined it. You know, mm -hmm. because I contend I don't know if it's only criteria, uh, only way to judge a good director. But if you can get a performance from kids, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. It, it's, it's actually one of the, you know, you can, I thoroughly believe that you can basically get a performance or teach somebody what you want or how to perform. As long as they have a certain amount of stage presence coming into it and they want to be there, you can you can get what you, a performance out of any child um, just by working with them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, some people take more work than other people. But um, it, you know, it's very rewarding to take someone who's got very little little acting experience and be teaching them about acting and everything you need to know, um, sort of passing your information and your tools on to someone else. Because it reminds me of perhaps one of my favorite local directors, Jerry Crouch, mm -hmm. and he seems to have that ability to, to. He works with lots of kids oftentimes in shows, and boy, it's it's so amazing to watch them that they all really seem to be into it and they seem to be enjoying it. Mm -hmm. and I guess that's a challenge as a director. You have to get the message to people that you should look like you're having a good time on stage. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important as a director that you set the tone for the production. You try to give your actors a place where they feel safe and they feel like they can be creative, no matter what age. Um, and also, you want people to feel good about what they're doing. You want to, you know, give them a lot of praise and feedback, even if you're giving them notes about, you know, I want you to change this, this, and this, at the same time, you're building people up and you want them to walk away from the experience with like a, a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling about what they've just done. How about one of the director's biggest headaches, and you were telling me off the air that you're having this right now with the current play, mm -hmm. that you line out a play, you line out all the performers, everything's set, and then a couple weeks beforehand, somebody drops out of the play. Yes. That drive you crazy? Yes. Uh, I think... That's just part of the, even in the professional world, I've had people drop out of shows that I was directing. Uh, usually it happens because they have a scheduling conflict very early on, but in community theater, unfortunately, it happens all the time. And it is one of those things as a director, you just sort of go into everything with this idea in the back of your head, okay, well, if this happens or this happens, I, I have a game plan already kind of mapped out. Um, one of the worst things I ever had to do was to take an actor out of a role during right before Tech Week because they were not able to play the part, and it was heartbreaking. And it was a young actor. He was 16. Um, and so it was probably one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do. But it, at the same time, you always go into it thinking, okay, well, if this person has to move or if this doesn't work out, what am I going to do? Um, and I think that's part of... I want to say I won't say it's fun, but it is part of uh, the excitement, I guess, of directing in a way. That must also be one of the, the toughest things as a director to then have to tell people even before the show is uh, is on stage with the casting of it mm -hmm. that to be able to tell people you don't get the plot. You yes. know, it's it's really a, a challenge, I imagine, because mm -hmm. especially when you're working with people you're friendly with and mm -hmm. and, and and like. And that not everybody is right for every part. No, not everybody is. And I, and I try to tell people, I, I'm very big about if I do a show and I have an audition, I'm usually going to have a callback if it's a larger show. I really, you know, I'm very good about trying to tell people, you know, 
you're here because you have talent. You're here because I enjoyed your audition. Um, and I could go multiple ways with this role. And I think as an actor, I try to keep that in mind as well, that just because the part isn't yours is nothing personally about you or about your talent or your performance. It's, it's sometimes just about what I'm envisioning or what I see the part requiring or even sometimes as simple as how you blend with the other actors on the stage and who looks right with everyone else. Because that's one of the things I'm always admiring about a show. When I see it, and I'll say to myself, self, this is well cast, you know, mm -hmm. that, that these people are perfect for the part. And it's amazing how many directors do get that right, you mm -hmm. know, uh, and, and choose it. Go back to the one show you directed here that I had the pleasure of seeing, and it was the, um, what was the name of it again? Love Lost and What I Wore. And what I want to ask you is, how do you even come up with the idea of that, that that's a play I'd seen many times, and I'd mm -hmm. seen it almost as a straight reading. It was just mm -hmm. a bunch of women on stage reading, very touching, very poignant. But when you directed it, it came alive for me. How did you come up with that? Well, I think it started out, well, I, I had not, I was not familiar with the play when I was asked to direct it. And so one of the first things I did was I went online and went and looked at uh, I didn't even have the script yet, but just went in and looked at some other shows that had been done. And of course, traditionally, it is written as a reader's theater. That is how it was done on Broadway. Um, but I went online and started looking at some different videos, and there was a lot of different ways of approaching that play, I found out. So one of my very first questions was, do I have to do this as a reader's theater? Can I stage it? And I was told yes. So it, it that was probably the most creative and artistically large challenge I've ever had. I don't know if that's a word. But we, you know, to try to take something that was stagnant for fi five women on stools and turn it into what ended up being a production in the round with costumes and props and, and entrances and exits. And it was almost like choreographing in the way the way that show is done because it's so such a, a non-traditional, non-linear kind of show. But it was just, it was a lot of fun. I told my actresses when we came into it, I chose you guys because I felt like you were all here to take artistic risks. And so they had a lot of say-so in how some of those things were staged. And it just worked beautifully. It really it, did. It really did. Because, again, you took a play that I'd seen before, wasn't my all-time favorite. And afterward, you know, I, the only thing I felt bad, I said to my wife, she didn't see it with me that night. I said, you really missed this. And then we saw another production of it later, mm -hmm. very st static, very, you know, it was okay. Mm -hmm. But U.S. was just one of the, you know, Thank you. really hit it. So. Does that mean we're going to have you do some more directing in the area? I would love to do some more directing in the area. Um, I think it's right now I'm needing a little bit of a hiatus. This is about, I did six shows last year right in a row. Um, I took a little break at the beginning of this year, and now I'm back doing another show. So I, I'm wanting to take a, a break from theater, but I usually I like to direct a show like once a year or once every other year and just really put a whole lot of energy into it, make it, a, you know, the best that I can make it, and then take a little time, go back, kind of reassess, and come back to another show. You mentioned something um, in terms of advice I'd like to flush out a little bit more. In terms of something you're going to direct or even be in, is it a good idea or a bad idea to see the movie beforehand? I really think it depends on the show. Um, as a director, I try to do every kind of research I can. If there is a movie, I will, I, as long as it is somehow related to the show itself, I will watch the movie. Um, I will watch, you know, YouTube videos of other productions and things and try to get, I, I will st admit that I, you know, I don't believe in, if something is working well for someone else, don't go reinvent the wheel, take what works and then expand on it yourself. But um, as an actor, sometimes it's helpful and sometimes it isn't. Um, when I audition for August Osage, I was very familiar with the movie because I had seen it not too terribly long ago. Um, but I was not familiar so much with the play. So that was a, and it's, and it's although very similar in um, the dialogue, the tone is very different in the play. Um, so that was it, was, it was a little bit refreshing not to go back to that movie that was, in my opinion, kind of dramatic and, and dark and try to find some lightness into a show. And I guess the key is, too, you don't want to then be in the show to be the same person mm -hmm. that was in the movie. No. And I think, I, you know, I, I really feel like even if I reference that, it's going to come out differently on me. I, I, I don't try to copy people's, uh, how they've played a part or what they've done. But I, I also know that part of what I'm bringing to the table is myself and how, you know, I, I can only 
like you said, not every part is for everybody. I can only, I have my own range and my own areas. And even though I can transform into someone else, it's still some it has to come from me somewhere to be authentic. Victoria, if anybody wants to see the show, then you're currently in. The run, it runs from when to when and where? It runs May 31st to June 9th. It's at Hendersonville Community Theater. Um, if you want more information, you need to go to Hendersonville Theater, and that's spelled T-H-E-A-T-R-E dot org, and you can buy tickets on their website. And uh, it is in downtown Hendersonville, which is a wonderful place to come and see a show. I'd like to thank you for being my guest this second half hour on the Blaine's World Show, Victoria Lamberth. Also, my guest this first uh, half hour is Nelson Sartoris. Also, thanks to Amy Prisnash, my producer, and to Zuzu Welsh, who provided the music you heard at the beginning of the show, and you'll now be hearing at the end. Uh, please join me next Wednesday at 9 a.m. here in the new WPVM LP in Asheville. You can also listen online at WPVMFM.org or watch us on Facebook Live.